All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, the sale is pretty full, so I guess this is going to be an interesting talk. Uh, we are on a tight schedule. Um, our speaker, Jake Applebaum, is going to be joined by Julian Assange via, via video stream. I really hope that's going to work. Um, <laughs> so without further ado, please welcome our speaker and have fun. So, we have a surprise guest. Some of you might know her. She saved Edward Snowden's life. Her name is Sarah Harrison. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, good evening. My name is Sarah Harrison, as you all appear to know. Um, I'm a journalist working for WikiLeaks. This year I was part, as Jacob just said, of the WikiLeaks team that saved Snowden from a life in prison. This act of my job has meant that our legal advice is that I do not return to my home, the United Kingdom, due to the ongoing terrorism investigation there in relation to the movement of Edward Snowden documents. The UK government has chosen to define disclosing classified documents with an intent to influence government behaviour as terrorism. I'm therefore currently remaining in Germany. But it's not just myself personally that has legal issues at WikiLeaks. For a fourth Christmas, our editor Julian Assange continues to be detained without charge in the UK. He's been granted formal political asylum by Ecuador due to the threat from the United States. But in breach of international law, the UK continues to refuse to allow him his legal right to take up this asylum. In November of this year, a US government official confirmed that the enormous grand jury investigation, which commenced in 2010, into WikiLeaks, its staff, and specifically Julian Assange, continues. This was then confirmed by the spokesperson of the prosecutor's office in Virginia. The Icelandic Parliament held an inquiry earlier this year where it found that the FBI had secretly and unlawfully sent nine agents to Iceland to conduct an investigation into WikiLeaks there. Further secret interrogations took place in Denmark and Washington. The informant they were speaking with has been charged with fraud and convicted on other charges in Iceland. In the Icelandic Supreme Court, we won a substantial victory over the extra-legal US financial blockade that was erected against us in 2010 by Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, and other US financial giants. Subsequently, MasterCard pulled out of the blockade. We've since filed a $77 million legal case against Visa for damages. We filed a suit against Visa in Denmark as well. And in response to questions about how PayPal's owner can start a free press outlet whilst blocking another media organisation, he's announced that the PayPal blockade of WikiLeaks has ended. We have... Sorry. That wasn't meant to be a pause for a clap. I just needed some water. Sorry. <laughs> we filed criminal cases in Sweden and Germany in relation to the unlawful intelligence activity against us there, including in the CC, at the CCC in 2009. Together with the Centre for Constitutional Rights, we filed a suit against the US military against the unprecedented secrecy applied to Chelsea Manning's trial. Yet through these attacks, we have continued our publishing work. In April of this year, we launched the Public Library of US Diplomacy, the largest and most comprehensive searchable database of US diplomatic cables in the world. This coincided with our release of 1.7 million US cables from the Kissinger period. 
we launched our third Spy Files, 249 documents from 92 global intelligence contractors, exposing their technology, methods and contracts. We completed releasing the global intelligence files, over 5 million emails from US intelligence firm Stratfor, the revelations from which included documenting their spying on activists around the globe. We published the primary negotiating positions for 14 countries of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a new international legal regime that would control 40% of the world's GDP. As well as getting Snowden asylum, we set up Mr Snowden's Defence Fund, part of a broader endeavour, the Journalistic Source Protection Defence Fund, which aims to protect and fund sources in trouble. This will be an important fund for future sources, especially when we look at the US crackdown on whistleblowers like Snowden and alleged WikiLeaks source Chelsea Manning, who was sentenced this year to 35 years in prison, and another alleged WikiLeaks source, Jeremy Hammond, who was sentenced to 10 years in prison this November. These men, Snowden, Manning and Hammond, are prime examples of a politicised youth who have grown up with a free internet and want to keep it that way. It is this class of people that we are here to discuss this evening, the powers they and we all have and can have, and the good that we can do with it. I am joined here tonight for this discussion by two men I admire hugely. Hopefully one of them will appear soon. <laughs> WikiLeaks Editor-in-Chief Julian Assange and Jacob Applebaum, both who have had a long history in defending our right to knowledge despite political and legal pressure. There he is. <laughs> So, Julian, seeing as I haven't seen you for quite a while, um, I, what's been happening in this field this year? What's your strategic view about it, this fight for freedom of knowledge? Are we winning or are we losing? Well, I have an 18-page speech on the strategic vision, but uh, I think I've got about five minutes, right? So... Uh, the most. <laughs> no, less? Uh, okay. Well, first off, it's very interesting to see the CCC uh, has grown by 30% over last year. Uh, and we can see the CCC in, as a, a type of, a very important type of institution, which does have analogs. The CCC is a paradox in that it has the vibrancy of a young movement that also now has been going nearly 30 years since its founding uh, in 1981 uh, by Well Holland and others. <laughs> great point, great point. <laughs> Blame the NSA. Huh? Blame the NSA. Yeah. So the new plane, Canada. <laughs> Is it here or the embassy that they're spying on the most? <laughs> See. Such a good talk, isn't it, guys? <laughs> I wish, you know, so, I wish Bruce Willis would pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> should, we, should we move over while we're waiting to, to you, Jake? Um, as I was saying, I think that it's quite interesting. It does seem to be a trend that there are these young technical people. We look at Manning, Snowden, Hammond, um, often sysadmins. Why are they playing such an important role in this fight for freedom of information? Well, so I think there are a couple important points. The first important point is to understand that all of us have agency, but some of us actually literally have more agency than others in the sense that you have access to systems that give you access to information that help to found knowledge that you have in your, your own head. So someone like Manning or someone like Snowden who has access to these documents in the course of their work, they will simply have a better understanding of what is actually happening they have access to the primary source documents as part of their job. This, I think, fundamentally is a, a really critical, uh, I, th I would say, a formative thing. When you start to read these original source documents, you start to understand the way that organizations actually think internally. I mean, this is one of the things that Julian Assange has said quite a lot. It's that when you read the internal documents of an organization, that's how they really think about a thing. This is different than a press release. 
And people who have grown up on the internet, and they're essentially natives on the internet, and that's all of us, I think, for the most part, it's definitely me, that, that essentially forms a way of thinking about organizations where the official thing that they say is not interesting. You know that there's an agenda behind that. And you don't necessarily know what that true agenda is. And so people who grow up in, up in this and see these documents, they realize the agency that they have. They understand it, they see that power, and they want to do something about it in some cases. Some people do it in small starts and fits. So there are lots of sources for lots of newspapers that are inside of defense organizations or really, really large companies, and they share this information. But in the case of Chelsea Manning, in the case of Snowden, they went big. And I presume that this is because of the scale of the wrongdoing that they saw, in addition to the amount of agency that was provided by their access and by their understanding of the actual information that they were able to have in their possession. And do you think that it's something to do with the being technical, they have a potential ability to, to find a way to do this safer than other people, perhaps? Or? I mean, it's, it's clearly the case that this helps. There's no question that understanding how to use those computer systems and being able to navigate them, that that is going to be a helpful skill. But I think what it really is is that these are people who grew up in an era and I myself am one of these people where we grew up in an era where we are overloaded by information, but we still are able to absorb a great deal of it. And we really, we really are constantly going through this. And if we look to the past, we see that it's not just technical people. It's actually people who have an analytical mind. So, for example, Daniel Ellsberg, who's famous for the Ellsberg paradox, he was, of course, a very seriously embedded person in the U.S. military. Um, he was in the RAND Corporation. He worked with McNamara. And during the Vietnam War, he had access to huge amounts of information. And it was the ability to analyze this information and to understand, in this case, how the U.S. government during the Vietnam War was lying to the entire world. And it was the magnitude of those lies, combined with the ability to prove that they were lies, uh, that I believe combined with this analytical skill, it was clear what the action might be, but it wasn't clear what the outcome would be. And with Ellsberg, the outcome was a very positive one. In fact, it's the most positive outcome for any whistleblower so far that I know of in the history of the United States and maybe even in the world. What we see right now with Snowden and what we've now seen with Chelsea Manning is unfortunately a very different outcome, at least for Manning. So this is, a, this is also a hugely important point, which is that Ellsberg did this in the context of resistance against the Vietnam War. And when Ellsberg did this, there were huge support networks. There were gigantic uh, things that split across all political spectrums of society. And so it is the analytical framework that we find ourselves with still, but additionally with the internet. And so every single person here that works as a sysadmin, could you raise your hand? Right. You represent and I'm sorry to steal Julian's thunder, but he was using Skype, and, um, well. <laughs> <clears throat> we all know Skype has interception and man in the middle problems, so I'm going to take advantage of that fact. You see, it's not just the NSA. <laughs> Everyone that raised their hand, you should, you should raise your hand again. If you work at a company where you think that they might be involved in something that is a little bit scary, keep your hand up. <laughs> right. So here's the deal. Everybody else in the room lacks the information that you probably have access to. And if you were to make a moral judgment, if you were to make an ethical consideration about these things, it would be the case that as a political class, you would be able to inform all of the other political classes in this room, all of the other people in this room, in a way that only you have the agency to do. And those who benefit from you never doing that are the other people that have that. Those people also are members of other classes as well. And so the question is, if you were to unite as a political class, and we are to unite with you in that political class, we can see that there's a contextual way to view this through a, a, a historical lens, essentially, which is to say that when the industrialized workers of the world decided that race and gender were not lines that we should split on, but instead we should look at workers and owners, 
then we started to see real change in the way that workers were treated and in the way that the world itself was organizing labor. And this is a hugely important change during the Industrial Revolution. And we are going through a very similar time now with regard to information politics and with regard to the value of information in our information age. <laughs> Fantastic, Bruce Willis. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, Julian, use Jitsi already. And so we've identified the potential people that you're talking about. So you've t spoken about how it's good for them to unite. What are the next steps? How do they come forth? How do they share this information? Well, let's, let's consider a couple of things. First is that Bradley Manning, now Chelsea Manning, Daniel Ellsberg, still Daniel Ellsberg, <laughs> Edward Snowden, living in exile in Russia, unfortunately. Still Edward Snowden. <laughs> still Edward Snowden, hopefully. <laughs> These are people who have taken great actions where they did not even set out to sacrifice themselves. But once when I met Daniel Ellsberg, he said, wouldn't you go to prison for the rest of your life to end this war? This is something he asked me, and he asked it to me quite seriously. And it's very incredible to be able to ask a hypothetical question of someone. That wasn't a hypothetical question. What he was trying to say is that right now, you can make a choice in which you can actually have a huge impact should you choose to take on that risk. But the point is not to set out to martyr yourself. The point is to set out, are you gonna stick around this time, Julian? I, I don't know, I'm waiting for the quantum hand, Jake. <laughs> the quantum hand that wants to strangle you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we were, we were just uh, discussing right now the previous context, that is, Daniel Ellsberg, the Edward Snowdens, the Chelsea Mannings, how they have done an honorable, a good thing, where they have shown a duty to a greater humanity, a thing that is more important than loyalty, for example, to a bureaucratic oath, but rather loyalty to universal principles. So the next question is, how does that relate to the people that are here in the audience? How is it that the case that people who have access to systems where they have said themselves they think the companies they work for are sort of questionable or doing dangerous things in the world? Where do we go from people who have done these things previously to these people in the audience? Well, look, I don't know how much ground you, you covered, but I think it's important uh, that we recognize what we are and what we uh, have become, and that high-tech workers are a class. Uh, in fact, very often a class a class, but a, a position uh, to, in fact, control the levers of society. The institution from the NSA, the CIA, the tax <laughs> would cease operating tomorrow. Should we just leave him like that and continue? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Am I back? Yeah. yeah. You've got three minutes to say something. All right. Make uh, it good. Those high tech workers, we are a particular class, and it's time that we recognized that we are a class and looked back in history and understood uh, that the great gains in human rights and education and so on that were gained through uh, powerful industrial workers which formed the backbone of the economy uh, of the 20th century, uh, that we have that same ability, but even more so because of the greater interconnection that exists now economically and politically, which is all underpinned by system administrators. And we should understand that system administrators are not just those people who uh, administer one unique system or another. Uh, they are the people who administer systems. And the system that exists globally now is created by the interconnection of many individual systems. And uh, <coughs> we are all, uh, or many of us, are part of administering that system and have extraordinary power uh, in a way that is 
really an order of magnitude different to the power of industrial workers had back in the 20th century. Uh, and we can see that in the cases of the famous leaks that WikiLeaks has done or the uh, recent Edward Snowden revelations. It is possible now for even a single system administrator to have a very significant uh, change to the, uh, or rather apply a very significant constraint, a, a constructive constraint to the behavior of these organizations, not merely uh, wrecking or disabling them, not merely going out on strikes to change uh, policy, but rather shifting information from uh, uh, an information apartheid system which we're developing from those with extraordinary power and extraordinary information into the knowledge commons where it can be used to cons not only as a disciplining force uh, but it can be used to construct uh, and understand uh, the new world that we're entering into. Now Hayden, the former director of the CIA and NSA, is terrified of this. Uh, in cypherpunks, we called for this directly uh, last year. Uh, but <coughs> um, to give you an interesting quote uh, from um, uh, Hayden, uh, possibly following up on those words uh, of mine and others, um, we need to recruit from Snowden's generation, says Hayden. We need to recruit from this group because they have the skills that we require. So the challenge is how to recruit this talent while also protecting ourselves from the small fraction of the population that has this romantic attachment to absolute transparency at all costs. And that's us, right? So what we need to do is uh, spread that message and go into all those organisations. In fact, deal with them. I'm not saying don't uh, join the CAA. No, go and join the CAA. Go in there. Uh, go into the ballpark and get the ball and bring it out uh, with that understanding uh, with the paranoia that all those organisations uh, will be infiltrated by this generation, by an ideology that is spread across the internet. And every young person is educated on the internet. There will be no person uh, that has not been exposed uh, to this ideology uh, of transparency and understanding of wanting to keep the internet which we were born into free. This is the last free generation, uh, the coming together of the systems of governments, the new information apartheid uh, <coughs> across the world, the linking together, is such that none of us uh, will be able to escape it uh, in just a decade. Uh, our identities will be coupled to it, the information sharing is such that none of us will be able to escape it. We are all becoming part of the state, whether we like it or not. So our only hope is to determine what sort of state it is that we are going to become part of, and we can do that uh, by looking uh, and being inspired by some of the actions that produce uh, human rights and free education and so on, by people recognising that they were part of the state, recognising their own power uh, and taking concrete and robust action to uh, make sure they lived in the sort of society that they wanted to and not uh, in a hellhole dystopia. Thank you. <clears throat> So basically all those poor people Jake just made identify themselves. Uh, you have the power to change more systems than the one you're working on right now. Um, and I think it's time to take some questions because we don't have long left. If there are any, I do, what's the? If you do have questions, please line up uh, in the middle of the room. We have microphones there. Well, why, why we... If you cannot reach one, please put your hand up and we'll try to get one to you. <coughs> While we wait for the first question, I'd just like to say, I'm not sure how many people in there. Start going to like the mic even while he's talking if you do have a question, because yeah. otherwise we won't know that you have one and it looks like we'll just keep on going. <laughs> yeah, I can go for a long time. Alternatively, just uh, raise your hand and we'll try like to get to it. looks like there's quite a lot of people there, but you should all know that uh, due to the various sorts of proximity measures that are now employed by NSA, GCHQ and Five Eyes Alliance, uh, if you've come there with a telephone, or if you've been in, even in Hamburg with a telephone, uh, you are all now coupled uh, to us. You are coupled to this event. You are coupled to this speech in an irrevocable way. Uh, and that is now true for many people. Uh, so either we have to uh, take command of the position that we have, understand the position we have, understand 
that we are the last three free people and the last people essentially with an ability to act in a situation, uh, or we are the group that will be crushed because of this association. Okay, I think we have a question at the mic four. So you were talking about the sysadmins here. What about those people who are not sysadmins? Uh, not only joining CAA and those companies, what else can we do? Jake, do you want to have a go at that one? Sure. So this is a question of agency, Good right? Timing. It's a question in which one, one has to ask very simply, what is it that you feel like you can do? And many people that are in this audience, I've had this discussion with them. For example, Edward Snowden did not save himself. I mean, he obviously had some ideas, but Sarah, for example, not as a system administrator, but as someone who was willing to risk her person. She helped as a source specifically for source protection, she took actions to protect him. So there are plenty of things that can be done. To give you some ideas, Edward Snowden's still sitting in Russia now. There are things that can be done to help him even now. And there are things to show that if we can succeed in saving Edward Snowden's life and to keep him free, that the next Edward Snowden will have that to look forward to. And if we look also to what has happened to Chelsea Manning, we see Additionally, that Snowden has clearly learned, just as Thomas Drake and Bill Binney sets an example for every single person about what to do or what not to do. It's not just about system administrators, it's about all of us actually recognizing we that positive contribution that each of us can make. Okay, our next question will be microphone four, uh, two, please. Hi, Julian. Um, I'm wondering, do you believe that transparency alone is enough to inject some form of conscience into evil organizations, so quote unquote evil organizations? Um, and if not, what do you believe the next step after transparency is? It's not about injecting conscience. It's about providing two things. One, an effective deterrent to particular forms of behavior, and two, uh, finding that information which allows us to construct and order the world around us, to educate uh, ourselves in how the world works and therefore be able to manage uh, the world that we are a, are a part of. Um, <coughs> the restriction of information, the restriction of those bits of information colours it. Uh, it gives off an economic signal that, that information is important when it's released because otherwise why would you spend so much work in restricting it. So the people who know it best restrict it. Uh, we should take their, their measurements of that information uh, as a guide and use that to pull it out where it can achieve uh, some kind of reform. That in itself is not enough. It creates an intellectual commons, um, which is part of our mutual education. Uh, but um, we need to understand, say, if we look at the Occupy uh, event, a very interesting political event, where um, revelations and perhaps destabilisation uh, led to a mass, a very large group of people wanting to do something. Uh, however, there was no organisational scaffold for these people to attach themselves to, no nucleus uh, for these people to uh, crystallise onto. Uh, and it is that problem, which is an endemic problem uh, of the anarchist left, actually, uh, the CCC, why are we having this right now? Because the CCC is an organised structure. It's a structure which has been able to grow to accommodate the 30% of extra people that have occurred this year, uh, to shift and change and act like a, uh, one of the better um, workers' universities that are around. So we have to form uh, uh, unions and networks uh, and create uh, programmes and organisational structures and those organisational structures can also be uh, written in code. Bitcoin, for example, is an organisational structure that creates an intermediary uh, between people. It sets up rules between uh, people. It may end up as a quite totalitarian system one day. Uh, who knows? But at the moment, it provides some kind of some kind of balancing. So, code and human structures uh, do things. WikiLeaks was able to rescue Edward Snowden because we are an organized institution with collective uh, experience. 
Okay, I think there's one question left from the, that's coming from the internet. Um, yes, on IRC there was the question, what was the most difficult part on uh, getting Snowden out of the uh, US? <laughs> oh, uh. That's quite a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's uh, interesting to, to think whether we can actually answer that question at all. Um, I'll give a, a variant of the answer. Because of the legal situation, it is a little bit difficult. <coughs> uh, as some of you may know, the UK government has admitted to spending uh, £6 million uh, a year approximately uh, surveilling this embassy in the police forces alone. Uh, so you can imagine the difficulty uh, in uh, communicating with various people in different countries uh, in relation to his diplomatic asylum and into logistics in Hong Kong uh, in a situation like that. Uh, and the only reason uh, we were able to succeed is, is because of uh, extremely diligent use. Perfectly timed. And we didn't use Skype. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have time for one more question? Uh, I think uh, we ran out of our time. I'm very that sorry. was such a fantastic, perfect way to make sure that you didn't learn the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for this talk. Uh, but I want you all to still thank you. Jake Applebaum, thank you. I'm very sorry.